Welcome to the National Soccer Coaches Association of America Winter Webinar Series. My name is David Newbury and I'm the coordinator of the NSCAA's Club Standards Project, an initiative designed to raise the performance of players and coaches one club at a time. Since May 2012, we have had over 625 clubs join our project representing approximately 405,000 players and 35,000 coaches. The NSCAA is delighted to have Rick Granrid, the NSCAA Club Standards Project Consultant and Director of Operations with Austin, Te Austin Aztecs to present today's topic, which is getting the most out of volunteer recreation coaches. Rick has accumulated over 30 years of experience at the youth, collegiate and professional levels. As a goalkeeper, he was named to the high school all-time great players of Illinois State Tournament, appeared in two Division I national tournaments with the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and won a league championship with the Detroit Express as a professional. Rick has had a varied coaching career, which made him an excellent candidate for a consultancy role with the NFCAA's Club Standards Project. He has coached with the University of Akron, Missouri Valley College, Chico State, and Southwestern University. He has, he has been the State Director of Coaching for South Texas Youth Soccer Association and was the Director of Coaching for several youth clubs. Rick has been an Executive Director for two youth organizations and Managing Director for the Minnesota Thunder Professional Club and is presently the Director of Operations for Austin Aztecs. Welcome, Rick, to the presentation. Thank you, David, and, uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, pardon my uh, little bit of a raspy voice and all that kind of stuff. I <coughs> got, the, uh, got the, the crud here a little bit, so hopefully everyone will hear me OK. Um, first of all, the, the foundation of my presentation today is to, to recognize and, and, more importantly, demonstrate that your coaches are the most important technical soccer feature of your program. Sure, you know, players, teams, fields, schedules, all those kind of things are, are certainly vital. But if the players don't kept, come back, then, then that's, that's no good. So today, I, I hope to provide you with some ideas to demonstrate your club's acknowledgement of the importance of your volunteer coaching staff and how to get the most out of them. Uh, one, one clarification, finding volunteer coaches is a whole other webinar. Um, maybe it's even a book, I don't know. I'm happy to briefly share my thoughts on that offline or in our question and answer follow-up or on LinkedIn, <laughs> excuse me. Or maybe you can lobby David to have me or someone else do another webinar on that one. Um, the players and families first and often lasting impression of the sport and your club as the team's coach, not the league president, not the director of coaching or the commissioner of coach coaches, it's really that person that they interact with several times a week. And I believe much care should be taken in the preparation of those team coaches. Uh, in so doing, they will feel supported by the club, and you will have them engaged. I'm sure you've heard of coaches being given a, a team and then left to kind of fend for themselves, and we want to avoid that scenario at all costs. Further, you know, I'm certain you've also had challenging seasons as a club with facility or weather or scheduling, referee, team formation issues, all those kind of things. But a solid team coach can manage any and all of those things and make the season a success for his or her team and players. Uh, your volunteer coaches then um, actually represent your members' experience in your club. Great fields, great uniforms, a great organization, that's all super. Uh, but a, a great experience with the team coach often trumps everything. Uh, again, just to acknowledge who these folks are, uh, generally your volunteer coaches have little knowledge of the game. They have limited playing background, and they've been convinced in some way to coach. Now, having done about 30 years of coaching courses all over the country, I've definitely seen an uptick in volunteer rec coaches who, who at least played 
through high school and, and off and beyond. Um, I, I really think a playing background is key. Not that a lack of playing experience necessarily makes for a poor coach, but it sure helps to having played the game. We've now kind of established how vital the volunteer coach is to our, our recreational program. Um, the focus of my presentation now shifts to how we want to make the most out of the coaches we do have. Um, on this slide, I emphasize staff. Uh, this is the fundamental means for me to get engagement uh, of the coaches and, and retention. Um, staff implies a group. So hey, I, I'm not alone as a coach. Staff implies that there's a head coach or a director, and I will receive some, some sort of guidance. Staff also implies that there's responsibility, that I have a specific expectations. So uh, hey, they're serious about this stuff. If coaches are recruited to be part of the staff from the very get-go, as opposed to, hey, that phone call that says, hey, you know, we need you to coach, your child's team won't, won't make, um, you will reduce the trepidation that they come in with, you'll increase their confidence in the program, and most important, you're going to increase the chances of retaining that coach. The, we, I, I talked earlier about how the coaches are the first impression uh, of the club and the lead to the families. Um, the preseason preparation, I think, is vital. And, and I believe the preseason staff meeting uh, is the first impression of the club or the league to the coaches. So if you can do this well as an organization, it sets a great tone for the rest of the season. Um, I try and make this, this preseason coaching staff meeting you know, a one-stop shop for the coaches if I can. In so doing, you create a hook to encourage attendance. Uh, I've made it a priority to have uniforms ready and organized into teams. You know, I put the coaches' names on there, all that kind of stuff, in time for my, for my staff meeting. Um, if the league can swing uh, an adult-sized uniform or maybe a club t-shirt for the coach to put in there, that's real cool, too. Uh, if I have any printed materials from the club, from the state, from the NSCAA, whatever, I'll have all of those on, on hand as well. Uh, if you can swing food and beverages at this, at this meeting, uh, that, that's fantastic. Uh, in one organization uh, I work for, we, we held our meeting at a local restaurant. Um, while well, coaches paid for their food and their drinks and everything, but they could eat, you know, before, during, and after the meeting. And so that was that was cool. Um, it's an important, but it is important in this meeting for the for the staff leader to preside over the meeting. Uh, he or she can have others present some stuff, but the the leader needs to be there and be active in the proceedings. Ideally, that the, the leader, that person, presents some information uh, as well. So once again, you're trying to engage the staff. You're trying to gain their trust and develop at least some sort of degree of affinity for, for yourself. Uh, continuing on some preseason stuff, uh, you want to reference or, or present uh, the training curriculum if it exists. Uh, if it does not exist, then that should be a priority for the club, certainly. Uh, often the, the actual training curriculum content uh, is, is generally a separate staff training, but you should at least reference it in your preseason meeting if it exists. Um, if, it's impo if it's possible to schedule training sites and times, man, do it. Uh, if the coaching staff doesn't have to scrounge around town for places for their teams to train, that's, that's great. Um, most of you probably need to identify random locations for training anyways. Uh, over time, you know where those places are. See if you can lock down their availability and, and schedule teams there. Uh, preferably, preferably by similar age groups, so that way there's some scrimmage opportunities there. Um, I've tried very hard to have playing schedules completed by this meeting also. If you can give the coaches their uniforms and their schedules together before the season starts, you will never see a happier group of people in America at that moment. Uh, that is fantastic if you can do that. Um, only a few occasions have I had the opportunity to include a field clinic in this event, and, and those were fantastic. Um, I like to select one technical theme, uh, for example, dribbling, 
and present that theme in, in age-specific progressions to demonstrate how the activities change from one group to the next. Uh, and I try to engage all the age group coaches in each of the age progressions by asking them to look for possible modifications for the activity that will make it appropriate for their age group. Again, in the preseason preparation, um, in addition to the, to the possible field clinic at the staff meeting, um, I schedule various age-appropriate license courses uh, in that preseason window. So for your fall season, you know, it's typically August, you know, maybe summertime uh, through before Labor Day. And in the spring, uh, maybe January and February, um, I always schedule the youth modules, the E, the state and regional diploma courses, anything like that about twice a year uh, during those time frames. And again, the more predictable you can be on the delivery of these from year to year, the more confident, the more engaged, and ultimately, you know, more educated your staff uh, is going to be. That's kind of my preseason stuff, and if you have any kind of questions or anything like that, I'd love to hear from you, and we can discuss at the end or, or on the Q&A uh, on, on LinkedIn. Continuing education. Um, again, many select and competitive level teams, uh, programs, excuse me, uh, feature coaching staff, continuing education activities throughout the season. For me, uh, having been in several organizations with both REC and SELECT, I simply included the recreational coaching sessions in that schedule. So um, I try to schedule hour-long sessions uh, midweek, you know, during training time, a few times per season, and on different nights um, so we don't conflict with, with our training days. Um, I send out via email an activity of the week uh, messages each week of the season. So. I would send these out to all the rec age groups. Uh, they can then be archived on your on your website. The activity of the week, in, in this case, is not a whole session, but it's a specific activity to be included in a, in a training session. Um, offering age group pool sessions uh, have proved uh, very popular in my experience. Uh, I sprinkle a few of those in each season. Uh, the idea is to offer uh, technical training sessions to players in an age group. Uh, with a special limitation of those age group coaches to come in and, and assist and, and observe. Um, that way I kind of get player and coach training all in, in one shot. More continuing education ideas are on this slide. Um, you could post full sessions if you wanted to. You can put them on the website or, or send uh, via an email. Um, I've offered to be the guest trainer for rec teams. Uh, I publicize the offer, and then coaches reply back to me with their training times and days and locations. I then connect, connect back with them for a day that works for me. Um, if your club has select level teams, I like to encourage your coaches to observe those sessions. Um, also observe those games, and I realize that could be a bit of a slippery slope, uh, and you guys probably know what I'm talking about there, but still, you know, I want them to get a feel for the entire club. Any questions on the continuing education stuff? That's kind of important uh, too, and and, you, and someone out there may have some other ideas that you can share with with the group as well. Um, as you can see, I, I favor creating a team of coaches, uh, a coaching team who works U4 through U19. And and you think the coaches of the say under 12s have a vested interest? in the quality of training and game expectations of the under eights? Sure they are. Now, do, do all these activities that I've suggested generate, you know, 50, 75 coaches each session? Uh, no, I'm afraid. Um, I've done quite a few of those you know, events or courses or sessions for one or two coaches. And uh, I'm always disappointed uh, when that happens. But I know that I've offered the opportunity Everyone knows I've, I've, I've offered the opportunity, and I know I can get good attendance at, at many of the events. Observe recreational game and games and the coaches. This far and away has always been the most informative, gratifying, and seemingly popular activity I've ever done at the or at what I do at the rec level. Uh, what I do is I get the master schedule. Uh, the weekend's games, 
and create an observation plan each weekend. I have several tasks which I take notes on. Uh, number one, I observe the level of play uh, at the various age groups. You know, technical level, tactical level, sportsmanship, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, it doesn't matter. From U5 to U19, that, that's kind of what I'm looking at. Um, I observe coaching behaviors. Um, I observe spectator behaviors. I observe the referees. And naturally, I observe the players. So I have a lot of stuff that I'm looking at every single weekend day. Um, I wear my club gear. I'm in visible areas of the park, and I'm there consistently. Uh, everyone comes to expect me to be out there watching. Uh, it, and it doesn't always have to be just the director, or it doesn't always have to only be the director. Um, the observations can be done with other available staff or board members as, as feasible. Um, then, based on the observations, I will share those general observations, like in a club message, uh, the following week. And again, I try to continue to engage everyone and letting them know, kind of, hey, this is what I see on the weekend. Um, also, during that weekend, I, I personally connect with players, coaches, and referees throughout the day. Uh, if I've seen a great game, uh, for sure, I will go up to the coaches and players right there and say so. Uh, if I see things which need correcting, for example, you know, that constant issue of defenders, you know, to push up right, you know, with the rest of the play, I'll meet with the coach after the game and discuss it. Um, as you can imagine, after a few weeks of this, they realize they are part of the staff. Uh, the coaches are important in player development. And, and we as an organization are helping them be a better coach. So I, I try and create that DOC type relationship with as many coaches as I can. Um, I also track players who I see, uh, no matter the age group, and I, and I put them into a spreadsheet. Um, I'll connect with the coaches and I'll let them know. I'll say, you know, man, I really like Johnny, you know, coach. You know, how does he do in practice? You know, whatever it is. Um, so. Uh, again, the more interest you take in, in their teams and their players, the more the coaches feel part of the team. And ultimately, more engaged uh, those coaches can be in, in your program. I don't know, does anyone else, if you're a DOC out there, does anybody else do that, that kind of stuff, or, or am I a lone ranger uh, on this? Uh, I ask, really, because each place I've been, they are so surprised. That, uh, that I do this, so um, hopefully I'm not the only one. Communication. Well, communication, 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 you can't have too much, for sure. Um, just about every job I've had, that was part of the job description, so uh, it comes pretty clear, pretty, pretty easily to me, uh, but perhaps it, it must not come so easy to, to others or else it wouldn't be a, a topic on, on all those job descriptions. Staff development. Uh, in, in any organization, staff development is critical to improving the quality of instruction and increasing the retention of players and coaches and ultimately, you know, positively affecting player development. That's, that's why the coaching staff is there. Um, I like to involve rec coaches in all phases of the program as feasible and appropriate. Um, you're going to identify coaches who, who become particularly engaged and, and more talented. Uh, I try to develop that by offering opportunities to assist with other training that we may have going on when I identify those, those coaches. Um, naturally, as the coaches move up with their kids through the age groups, many will stop coaching. Uh, of course, but you will find several who enjoy it and, and are actually pretty good. Um, I have no problem uh, at all with inviting them to be an assistant coach in their child's team if they're continuing up to the select or the, the academy level. Um, and, and also, I should say, on several occasions, I've actually hired uh, former recreational coaches to be team coaches on the select level teams. And, and that, everybody, and probably the DOCs out there, I mean, that is the best feeling in the world when you've taken a, quote, mom and dad coach from the rec and actually developed them, and they've developed them into uh, to, to be a competitive coach. Uh, that is really, really awesome for us. Well, 
the season uh, eventually ends for the players, and, and I, I try and extend it a little bit more for the coaches, uh, and, uh, and I do that by way of assessment. And, uh, and one thing I do is, uh, or I would suggest that you do as well, uh, is create or find uh, a self-assessment tool. Um, again, I'll send this out to the staff. It could be via email. It could be at a staff meeting. It could be a function, whatever it is. Um, I don't ask for it back, uh, but in that communication, I encourage them to send me any questions or comments that they have about any of the items in the assessment or about anything that they've experienced during the season. Um, I have not formally uh, assessed the recreational coaching staff. Um, the competitive, you know, select staff, absolutely. Uh, the rec staff, um, number one, I think there's probably too many. Uh, number two, some I'll get to know well, some I won't, so it's not real fair. Uh, three, I'm not sure if it's the right thing to do anyways. Uh, I, I, I believe the right thing to do on, on in this case is, is do whatever you can to, to support whatever they're, they're doing, and uh, that, that's the main thing. Um, however, I, I do monitor team formation, and I don't know about anyone out there, but uh, I always have worked within a core system, so you know people can return to the same team and all of that. Um, so I will know how many returning players uh, those rec coaches have to their teams, and how many players and families request to be on those particular coaches' teams, you know, over time. So uh, that's probably the ultimate in-house assessment that, that I can make for our recreational coaches and the best coaches as we know are the ones who continually continually keep the, the players playing. Well this slide kind of comes under the nice to do if you can uh, category. Uh, obviously it, it's always good to acknowledge the coaches time and efforts with the players if you can. Um, I, I know absolutely for sure that coaches' gifts and so on are generally not in, in many of the club's budgets. Uh, but luckily, at, uh, at the rec level and, and, and most of the time at the, at the competitive levels too, the coaches are acknowledged uh, by their teams with some sort of post-recognition gift or, or something like that. Guys, finally, just, just kind of as a summary of what uh, I've been uh, chatting with you uh, about today. Uh, Basically, uh, understand. Excuse me. <laughs> understand how important the coaches are to your rec program. Treat them as a staff, and simply take the time and an interest in helping them develop the players of tomorrow. Um, a final thought. Uh, I realize some of you may not have the bandwidth uh, to in your in your situations to do some of the things I've, I've said today. Uh, if that's the case, I would recommend a few ways to accomplish this stuff. Uh, number one, uh, if it's appropriate, you know, submit a proposal to your board to fund someone's time to do some of these things. Um, I can tell you uh, it will pay for itself with increased membership and retention of players. Uh, if funding is not an option, uh, create an internship uh, of some sort for a local college student, hopefully maybe graduate students uh, who have played the game and, and have some experience there. Also, try and engage uh, local coaches, uh, high school, college, professional coaches to come in and at least periodically and, and hopefully consistently and predictably to, to perform some of these things. Uh, it is generally in their best interests for the local recreational organizations to do well, so um, they will probably want to help you. Folks, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to, to be part of your, uh, your evening tonight. And uh, once again, I welcome any questions and uh, we'll respond to any questions or comments you may have. Thank you.